Good morning, everyone. And how's everybody doing this fine day? Hopefully, uh, another good work week that uh, everybody made it through okay. And it, uh, you look forward to the weekend. Let's start with a word of prayer. Oh, Lord, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. I would just I praise you and I thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us comfort and no matter what comes our way, that, uh, that you help us and guide us and strengthen us. And you help us today, uh, this word that you've given us to uh, to look at and that we can understand it and that uh, we can apply it to our lives. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Well, now we're going to pick a different group of people. Idolatrous elders. And now we're back, not so much in Jerusalem anymore. Now we're back in uh, by the river uh, Chaldea. Chaldea. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Let's look at the word again. Sometimes I just look at the word again. It uh, helps me to. Chabar. C H E B A R. Chabar. A uh, river Chabar. He's back down uh, near Chabar with his, uh, his uh, people he was uh, taken into captivity with. And they're basically working along the river. Uh, so I believe that, you know, they were like farming, uh, working labor type intensive jobs. Uh, again, they're under the uh, captivity of uh, Babylon. But from what I can gather, you know, as long as you uh, didn't really go against the king or try to uh, uh, cause trouble, you weren't going to have a bad time. And even God was saying that uh, just uh, just realize that you're going to uh, be there a while and settle in, uh, have families, and that, uh, that you'll be under the uh, control of uh, the King Nebuchadnezzar for the next 70 years. That's really all God was trying to say to them. And it's just that they were being very stubborn, that they didn't want to listen to the Lord, going back like 400 years. Uh, so God is uh, very, very patient. Uh, we need to remember that, but he's not patient forever. So, so let's just jump into the text. I split this book up again in, in uh, this particular uh, chapter in the two. Uh, so we'll be taking the first half today, which will be uh, verses 1 through 11. The second half has more to do with uh, a different topic. So we'll talk about that next week. So I didn't see where it would, uh, where I could like condense it and try to finish this chapter all together. So let's just start reading. Then came certain of the elders of Israel under me and sat before me. So here, uh, I guess the elders are starting to realize that uh, that uh, Ezekiel is a prophet, and that was quite common. The elders, uh, once they identified a prophet, they would actually uh, could come and ask for his advice. But in this particular case, uh, Ezekiel is going to give them some advice that the Lord is kind of whispering in his ear as he's talking to these people, from what I can gather. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men, so I can envision it now, Ezekiel's sitting here, uh, and these men came to him, and it, uh, and he's got, he, he can sense that the Holy Spirit is speaking to him. And, it's, and this is what he's saying to him. Son of man, these men have set up their idol in their heart and put a stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of, it, of at all by them? So it's like God is uh, kind of testing Ezekiel a little bit to find out uh, how he thinks that, uh, that God should channel it, almost like uh not asking advice, but uh, more like testing Ezekiel to uh, find out how he would uh, how he would handle a situation like this. And I thought I'd just point out a couple of uh, key points here that talks about stumbling blocks. Uh, and basically, a stumbling block, uh, many different kinds. But a stumbling block is something that you uh, you lead people astray by giving them this stumbling block. Uh, an example might be that, oh, uh, you know it's important for us to gather together to go to church on Sunday. But you got uh, two of your buddies at work that are that really love golf, and uh, they only and they claim they only have Sundays to play. 
So they talk you into uh, going and playing golf instead of going to church. And, you know, they might tell you, uh, just tell them that you're sick, you know, and you'll go next week or use some excuse. As soon as you start bending into that kind of thought process, uh, that they're going to get their way. And sooner or later, before you know it, you're going to realize that uh, that uh, what's more important is your pleasure rather than uh, than God. And so that's kind of what uh, God is going to be kind of testing the, uh, this situation here when it comes to these elders. Because I'm assuming, too, that these elders are actually uh, men of God, uh, that they are, or think they are, but that, uh, that they're coming to Ezekiel to talk to him about something. And so uh, I brought up, uh, going back to Ezekiel 316 uh, through 21, I thought I would bring up this as a, as a uh, reminder of a stumbling block. And it came to pass at the end of seven days, that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and, that, and thou givest him no warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but the blood will I require at thine hand. This is a basic classic saying that if, uh, we're here to warn people that, uh, that judgment will come someday and that they need to turn to the Lord. You gotta do it uh, too, uh, but if you don't warn them and you say, oh, let somebody else tell them, uh, I kind of like to use the analogy, let's say, you know, you're talking to somebody and they, and uh, you're safe, but that person is not, and you see this truck heading for their back, and you know it's going to hit them, and uh, if you don't warn that person, he dies, well, that person's blood is on you, and this is basically the same idea. Verse 19, yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast to live in thy soul. So basically that if you had warned him and he doesn't take heed to it and does it anyway, then it's no longer your problem is his. Again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity and I lay a stumbling block before him, this is like a, a stumbling block is like a test. And I lay before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin and his righteousness will be he hath none shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteousness sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned also that has to live in thy soul. In other words, if you would warn him and he, he takes the heed, he takes the advice and turns from his wicked way, then he'll also be saved. This is the analogy I, I see happening here when uh, God is talking to Ezekiel. Also, it mentions that uh, uh, about uh, should I be inquired of, of uh, all by them? Uh, and I, I saw this as uh, unanswered prayer when God no longer listen, is listening. And over in Deuteronomy 145, God talks about this through Moses. And ye returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. I'll never forget a uh, period of time that uh, I felt like the Lord had uh, had abandoned me, uh, that uh, I had really done something to upset him. And this wasn't really that long ago. And it, uh, I was really down. I was really depressed. And I thought I was praying to him. And I said, Lord, I need some comfort. I need some advice. Could you please help me, uh, Lord? <laughs> and I was doing this while I was out for a walk. And I was in tears, you know, I was, uh, whatever it was was bothering me. And to this day, I can't remember what it is now. But I'll never forget, I was uh, walking and I'd taken a little different path than I usually did. And so uh, uh, I was just walking along and all of a sudden this tr this vehicle pulled up beside me. And I, and I, to my uh, to my wondering eyes would appear, but past the storm was in the vehicle and uh, just happened to come down that same road, that same time frame that I needed somebody to talk to. We talked for a few minutes, and to me it was acknowledgement that no God had not given up on me, and that uh, I was uh, quite relieved when that happened. And so 
like when I read this verse, I just had to share that story. Uh, but back to uh, back to Ezekiel and what God is trying to help him uh, through with these elders. So verse four, therefore speak unto them. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that sitteth up his idols in his heart and put a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Well, I read through this, uh, some verses that, uh, well, I guess uh, read through this section, I'm gonna read four through six. Then I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they, ha they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, repent and turn yourself from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. So going back to my analogy of the, uh, the golf course, now most likely when you go play golf that day, I guarantee you that you're gonna feel guilty the whole time you're playing and it won't be enjoyable at all. And that's God in, in the background saying, you know, you're supposed to be in church and you're not there. Uh, and uh, I'm not happy with that. Uh, if you keep doing that, though, the sooner or later, the, the uh, God's little voice in your back of your mind uh, kind of gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And before you know it, you can almost justify in your mind that, uh, OK, God must be OK with it now because you stop talking. That's not necessarily the case. And usually if uh, I know that uh, for quite a while uh, I did backslide for many years uh, and I thought I was doing fine, but uh, uh, Finally, God, uh, through a series of events, brought me back in and helped me to understand where I was going astray. And that, uh, so I know it can happen to where you get so used to that, whatever stumbling block that he put in front of you, that you uh, uh, agreed to, that uh, sooner or later, that will become the center of your world and it becomes an idol. And that's what I'm trying to get to here. An idol in your heart doesn't necessarily mean some little figurine that you set up and you pray to and you worship. Uh, idols can be anything that come between you and God. And that's basically what this verse, I, I think, uh, this section of verses is talking about. It's among the great places. Uh, we see this is over in 1 Kings 8.47 through 49. Yet if they shall be thank themselves in the land where they were carried captives and repent, and make supplication on the day in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, We have sinned and have done pre perversely, we have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward the land which thou givest unto the fathers, the city which thou hast chastened, and the house which I have built for their name that hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, that thy dwelling place and maintain thy cause. So basically what I'm saying here is that what, I, what I'm seeing here is that God is punishing them by taking them into captivity. So he's trying to get their attention. Now he's got their attention, they're in captivity. And, and they're thinking, they're listening to all these false prophets telling them, oh, everything's gonna be fine, everything's gonna be good. Uh, God's not mad, you know. Uh, we're gonna get back into Jerusalem in just a short order. But instead of doing, instead of listening to those false prophets, that they would turn to God and say, yes, Lord, I know I was wrong. We were wrong. Uh, please forgive us and repent that God will come back to them. But at this point, God is not going to keep reaching out to them. It's now, it's basically on them that they're going to have to reach out back to God uh, and repent. Also Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while ye may be found. Call ye upon him while he is, ne he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And also I mean, John, I mean Jonah, is a great uh, example of uh, somebody who gets the uh, Real, I didn't even take the advice. Uh, it wasn't even advice from Jonah, but uh, the king of Nineveh, uh, just out of a whim, thought that maybe God might change his mind. Because Jonah had gone to Nineveh and basically said, 
40 days and you're, you're dead. God's going to destroy your, your city. No, no, re, you know, no recourse, no nothing like if you repent or anything like that, that God will save you. Actually, Jonah was being was incorrectly doing that. But uh, what's interesting is that the king of Nineveh decided that, well, maybe if I if I cause the entire nation to repent. And so he actually ordered the entire nation to repent. And God did change his heart and allowed them to live. That, we see that in Jonah 3, 6 through 9, uh, through 10. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe, robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. That's a, a Jewish way of basically uh, repenting. Uh, I was putting on a sackcloth, and then uh, they, they would put ashes on top of themselves. Almost like a, uh, as a visible sign of their repentance. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nivera by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So they were going to fast also. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from their violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn away and repent? And turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did not did it not. So this is an example where Nineveh just took it on their own. They weren't even following the advice of anybody. Uh, he just decided it was worth a shot. Uh, and God God granted it. Uh, so he turned to him, he repented. Uh, he heard the prayer of uh, the king of Nineveh, and it uh, gave him an extra. I forgot how long. It's like a. It was quite a while. But they ended up. Uh, they ended up uh, getting destroyed. I think it was like a hundred years later. Uh, don't remember exactly right now. Uh, I apologize. It may be less than that. But for a certain period of time, they went back into idolatry again, uh, and God did end up destroying Nineveh. But it wasn't at least not this time. So it just goes to show that when we repent. And we do it with an, uh, an honest heart that uh, God will forgive even the worst sins. Also, James over in James 4, 8 through 10. This is uh, the uh, brother of Jesus, half brother. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So basically, that uh, once we humble ourselves before the Lord and uh, and not try to make excuses, I learned that that doesn't work. You know, I always try to justify my actions by this or that. Uh, just put your mercy, uh, as the old saying goes, uh, put the mercy on the court and let God uh, take it from there. Also, Isaiah 30, 22. He filled the file also the covering of like graven images of silver and ornament of molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as menstruous cloth, and they shalt not say unto it, Get thee hence. So that's the other aspect of this particular story. You got to remove that stumbling block or that idol from your life too. You got to realize that it's there and remove it. Uh, and so whether it's something internal, uh, like you know, you just your thoughts are uh, elsewhere. You're not uh, you're not concentrating on the Lord. You're caring more about money or more about uh, your prestige or your power or your job. Uh, if those things uh, are getting in the way of your walk with the Lord, then they, you need to need to change your way. And that's what this verse is saying here in Isaiah. That if you're going to turn away from the Lord, you got to get rid of those all those graven images. Don't keep them around. Uh, get rid of them, even if they are made out of silver. Uh, Mold them down and uh, give it to the poor, you know. Also in Zephaniah 311, in that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. But then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and they shall no more be haunted because of my holy mountain. Again, just more more verses support the idea that uh, turn away from our wicked ways and look to the Lord, and he will re he will rejoice and uh, repent for us, uh, repent us, uh, forgive us. <laughs> Ezekiel 14, 7.
For every one of the house of Israel, of the strangers that sojourneth in Israel, which separates himself from me and set up his idols in his heart. And I, I probably didn't explain this earlier, but the idols in the heart are things that we keep in ourselves. They're not necessarily little figurines we bow down to. I think I did say that. But there's things that are in our heart that are causing us to be us, to cause a uh, division between us and God. And put us a stumbling block with his iniquity before his face and come unto the prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And he shall know that I am the Lord. So in this particular case, I, I struggled a little bit with this, but I think what I, uh, the way I understand this verse, uh, these two verses here, is that basically if you don't do it the proper way and you, and you make excuses for yourself and you, and you, you don't repent, but in this case, they're going to the prophet uh, Ezekiel in hopes to convince him of something that uh, God is, uh, is, is saying the opposite of, is the best way I can describe it. Oh, don't bother coming to the prophet to help, but to the Lord for their forgiveness. I can't help but think of a, uh, another denomination where they feel that, uh, you know, that uh, certain men are allowed to uh, uh, forgive sin. And that's kind of what I get the impression here is that uh, there were, these elders were coming to Ezekiel uh, for forgiveness rather than going to God. Well, in this particular case, uh, God is basically saying, don't bother going to the, uh, to the prophet. Uh, and that basically God was going to cut them off and he's going to make an example out of them. That's what I got, a sign and a proverb. It was going to make an example out of these people so that others will realize uh, that uh, what they're doing is wrong. So I guess the best way you could uh, take a look at this, if, like say that uh, your, your, your walk with the Lord is strong and people know that. And if they come to you and they try to convince you to say, Oh, that's okay. You know, that's not a problem. Uh, that God is okay with that. Uh, that uh, you now have become uh, a, a poor witness for that for that individual, and that uh, you're allowing them to uh, uh, continue in their sin, even though you know God is telling them that uh, what they're doing is wrong. So they're looking for confirmation that what they're doing is okay, and you're just supporting that, and that's not helping the situation. So that uh, God is going to make an example of them so that everyone knows. Yeah, I saw that set my face uh, idea and I found a couple of verses that help support or explain what that means. In Jeremiah 21, 10, For I have set my face against this city for evil and not for good, saith the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall burn it with fire. That was a, a best, I guess the best way to explain that is he's, he's made up his mind. Uh, he's not going to be changing his mind on that. And it talks about a sign. And over in Numbers 26.10, gives a good explanation of that. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when the company died. What time the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign. Now that's a great verse to understand what a sign is. This is a negative sign. It's a positive sign to those around it, but for the people involved in the sign, uh, it was a, definitely a negative. One thing all the way through this old, the Old Testament, it seemed like that, uh, that Israel needed a sign. Uh, even Jesus himself at one point comments that, uh, you know, that uh, this generation uh, needs a sign to see things. It, it was Thomas he said it to, but uh, uh, for us who uh, believe without a sign, that's, uh, that's an even better uh, they're more faithful than you are. In other words, if you need a sign, then uh, there's something uh, missing with your faith. So in this particular case, that was in Moses' time. And that's it, uh, the earth had swallowed up these people who had uh, defiled God. And so God uh, basically opened up the earth and swallowed them up. And so all the rest of the people around them saw that and said, oh, now we know that uh, what God doesn't like. So they became a sign. Also in Numbers 19, 20, 
But the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation, because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. Why did I add that in there? I don't even. That was a mistake. <laughs> Also, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things happen unto them for exam examples, and they are written for our abomination, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So, uh, this is Paul talking about uh, uh, about examples. When, when God uses examples to show us uh, what pleases God and what doesn't please God. Okay, Ezekiel 4, 9, 14, 9. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people. Okay, this is a very interesting verse. Uh, what I got out of this was the fact that, uh, that's why I bring up uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12 explains it really well. But I think that this, this verse is saying that basically, uh, if you continue in your, your ways and don't and don't correct your ways long enough, uh, that uh, at some point God is going to give in to you or allow you uh, to not see the truth, and He's going to send you into a, uh, a lie or deceive you. Uh, I think Second Thessalonians he explains it really well, starting at verse nine. Even Him who is coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, and they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So basically, at some point, is what I'm saying, what I think Ezekiel's talking about here, that God is going gonna, is gonna to stop knocking on the door, uh, per se that uh, at some point, he's just gonna leave the people to their own, uh, whatever whatever sin they're committing and turn his back on them. And that uh, he's gonna send them, and on top of that, he's gonna send them a strong delusion to where, and this is gonna happen in the tribulation. Uh, so if you keep saying no to God, no to God too many times uh, over the course of time, he's gonna stop, he's gonna stop asking. And he's also gonna send you a strong delusion, which, uh, it's very concerning. Ezekiel 14, 10. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. And this particular prophet they're talking about here is false prophets, I believe. That uh, they're going to be punished even more so. Uh, and I couldn't help but I thought I would share with you this whole thing about prophecy, because I, I see a lot of false prophets out there these days, and I couldn't help but think about the rules about, about prophecy. And so in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 10, is basically what God says about prophets. And I thought I'd read it. I'd never fully read it all before. And since we're talking so much about prophecy, then uh, maybe it's good to get this in uh, our vocabulary. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity, the punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Oh, I was hitting the wrong button. Back to Deuteronomy. <laughs> 31. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of, of signs, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and a sign of wonder comes to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. They shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage. 
to trust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. If thy brother or thy son or thy mother or the son or thy daughter or thy wife or thy bosom or the friend which is in thine own soul entice thee secretly saying, let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor their fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nay unto thee are far off from thee, from the one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, neither hearken unto him, neither shalt I, I pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. But thou shalt surely kill him, thy hand shall be upon, first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he died, because he has sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So that, and, uh, at least in Moses' time, if you were a false prophet, uh, that was your uh, doom. Uh, so in other words, if a, if a prophecy did not come true uh, that you spoke, uh, you would basically be stoned to death. And so uh, God would, uh, a good reminder that uh, God takes prophecy very, very seriously and all of his prophecies come true on 100%. So uh, I see a lot of uh, these people, especially on YouTube, just talking, Oh, I had this dream or I had this vision. Well, in our case, we have the word of God. And I know that uh, basically if you hear this stuff and you can't prove it in the word of God, then the prophecy is incorrect and not to believe it. Because all through, you know, I think about Matthew 24 and the fact that Jesus over and over and over again said, do not be deceived. Uh, that uh, and the false prophets are going to come uh, claiming to be uh Jesus and it's uh, and being false Christ are going to be coming. <laughs> and speaking of that, over in Revelation, talking about uh, the most famous false prophet uh, will be coming here in the future. Now, a lot of fellow Christians will be out of here for this, but uh, if anyone's listening to this and uh, it's after the rapture, this is the person that you got to avoid with all cost. <clears throat> Him and his and his buddy, uh, the Antichrist. Revelation 19, 19. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. <clears throat> and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now this particular verse is when Jesus comes back uh, with us a second time. So we're going to see this. <laughs> I like the saying that uh, uh, when we come back, when Jesus comes back on the earth, you don't want to, you don't want to see him in front of us. You want to see his backside. Uh, that's the good side to be on in that particular arrangement. He's coming back to destroy all the uh, all those who took the mark of the beast. <clears throat> No, Ezekiel 14, 11. That's where we're going to end for today. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all thy transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. So I think basically what's happening here is the elders had come uh, to uh, Ezekiel, probably for advice on, uh, uh, and that God was kind of whispering in Ezekiel's ear saying that, uh, they got a stumbling block. They have idols they need to get rid of and take care of before they uh, before I'm going to speak to them again, and that they need to work on that, and that they need to approach me for repentance, and then I'll speak to them directly, and that they don't need to go through you to uh, to get forgiven. They need to come directly to me, but they got to come with a pure heart is what I basically gather, and so. Uh, and I think that these elders are probably people are coming to, uh, maybe we'll find out in a few short chapters, <clears throat> that believe, are, starting, are, are, are not believing what they're hearing from these false prophets. They've been following them, and now they're realizing uh, their mistake. So I think that uh, Ezekiel is basically going to tell them, you need to take that up with the, with the Lord, and what I'm telling you is true. Because he's been prophesying this whole time 
that uh, what's been going on. So now it's up to them that they have to repent with the Lord. There's nothing Ezekiel is going to be able to do for it. So uh, that'll be it for today. And I will uh, end with a prayer. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for this time to look into your word. And thank you, Lord, so much for all that you do. And thank you so much for uh, just being there and uh, giving us counsel and uh, comfort. And we can always look to you whenever we need your help. And I praise you and I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. And I will uh, talk to you guys tomorrow. Hope you have a good day. And uh, see, tonight is tug. Uh, so that, uh, so Kevin, if you're having to hear this, if, 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 this, if we're not doing tug, please give me a, a text. I'll probably text you. Anyways, and I think we're on episode seven of season one. And uh, for those children fans out there, the uh, the last uh, episode for season two is actually playing Sunday night. So at, uh, uh, if, uh, Nancy, if you're watching, uh, that uh, you can go ahead and binge watch maybe next week, uh, all eight at some point, but they'll be all out. So I will talk to you guys uh, on Monday.